The now we'll go to the honorable member for Beaches East York. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I apologize in advance if there is noise in the background. It's either traffic or it's my kids, so I've chosen traffic. I want to start first by speaking to what is at stake with C7 and with the medical assistance in dying framework overall. And what is at stake fundamentally is first alleviating intolerable cruel suffering. The Supreme Court and other courts have spoken about the cruel choice that individuals face when they are in the circumstance where they have a sound mind, they are of capacity and can make these decisions for themselves, where they are suffering from an illness that is not going to go away, and when they are suffering in an intolerable way, and forcing that suffering upon individuals is, is cruel. And we have to be cognizant of the fact that this is first and foremost about alleviating suffering, suffering, but is about alleviating suffering within the context of empowering and respecting one's personal autonomy. This is fundamentally about individual rights, and our job, our job fundamentally is to respect those individual rights, to protect those individual rights, to ensure that we end suffering in the course of protecting those individual rights, and to make sure that we fulfill the promise that of Section 7 as it's been interpreted and upheld by our courts, not only in the, in the unanimous decision of Carter by the Supreme Court, but also by other courts, the Alberta Court of Appeal and more. Now, this bill is important, and it's important because it addresses a long-standing concern with C-14. It addresses the concern that we had not answered the call from the Supreme Court adequately. We'd added an additional criterion unnecessarily. We had basically said, if you are suffering intolerably, and you can absolutely make this choice yourself, you have capacity, and you have a, an irreme irremediable condition, an effectively incurable illness, you can't access this regime if you're not near the end of your life or, or there isn't path dependency. We, you, you know the trajectory that you're on, even if you are already intolerably suffering. And this, that obviously was unconstitutional. The, the courts have determined that to be so. The, the government rightly opted not to appeal that decision, and, and here we are. Now, importantly, we've actually gone beyond what the court has mandated in pursuit of individual rights and respect for our charter. And we've said, in the case of Audrey Parker, a woman who chose to end her life earlier than she had wanted to. She wanted to get through the holiday season, but she also didn't want to lose capacity and then lose the option. She didn't want to lose the ability to end her life and, and to end her suffering. She didn't want to lose the possibility of death with dignity. So she chose to end her life before she wanted to. And Thankfully, we've actually gone above and beyond what the court has mandated us to do, and we have provided one form of, of advance request to ensure that individuals, like in Audrey's case, don't end their life before they, they, they would like to. So this bill on those two fronts is positive. Now, there are some challenges, and, and, and it's not going to stop me from supporting this legislation at second reading, Mr. Speaker, but it does give one pause, and I think we as parliamentarians ought to be very careful about adding additional, adding additional exclusions to accessing the MAID regime. And that is what this bill does, unfortunately. And I've heard others speak to the issue of mental illness, and there are reasons to proceed cautiously, but there aren't good reasons for blanket exclusions. And in fact, we, we, we potentially render the bill unconstitutional with blanket exclusions, just as we did with exclusions in C-14. And so I hope at committee there's expert testimony on on this piece and I, and I hope we get this right because and, and I'll and I'll give the example specifically on mental illness there is mr. speaker in 2016 there was a case at the Alberta Court of Appeal a woman identified as EF and she was she had capacity she was suffering intolerably it was irremediable she had consulted with her family and she had made the decision to end her life and she was able to do so, thankfully, because of the Alberta Court of Appeal applying the decision in Carter by the Supreme Court. But if the Justice Department, the Federal Justice Department, had had its way in that case, we, they would have read down Carter to mean only terminal illness. And the court said, well, that's not the case. And then we saw through C-14, our government tried to impose that kind of criteria, and the court subsequently struck it down. So Justice Department loses that, that, that leg of the argument. Then in EF, they put forward the argument that it could not be an underlying psychiatric condition on its own, but that's exactly what EF was, an underlying psychiatric condition. 
And yet the court said this underlying psychiatric condition, which manifested itself in great significant pain on the record, on the documented evidence, it did not affect her capacity to make a decision. She was of a sound mind. And the court in EF, the Alberta Court of Appeal, went beyond that. And they said, actually, this consideration as to whether mental illness, whether MAID should be available to people with mental illness as their sole underlying condition, the Alberta Court of Appeal in EF said, well, actually, the Supreme Court in Carter has canvassed this conversation. They've canvassed this discussion. They have canvassed this concern. And unanimously, they have determined that that is not a criteria that would that is not an additional exclusion that's not a factor to exclude that's not an additional criterion for eligibility that those with mental illnesses and those with physical illnesses so long as they meet the specific criteria of an irremediable condition of intolerable suffering suffering and that one has capacity and it may be that one is depressed. It may be that one is suffering of a mental health issue such that it impinges upon one's capacity to consent. But in other cases, it clearly does not. And in EF, it did not. And the justice lawyers lost that case. And yet here we are in C-14, they, they added an additional criterion of a close to terminal illness, reasonable foreseeable death, and it was struck down. And here, Justice Department is adding that second argument from EF that they've already lost on in the courts, and they're adding a blanket exclusion to mental illness. And what I would say, as a matter of constitutionality, if this excludes the case of ES, which EF, which it does, then it creates a, a ready constitutional challenge. And I'll be reading the charter statement from the Justice Department very closely, because unless they answer that concern, a blanket exclusion on mental health, and I'm not suggesting that we don't proceed cautiously, but a blanket exclusion on mental health, where there is a case like EF before the court, it is likely to render this law unconstitutional. And that has to be addressed by the committee. The second piece I, I want to flag is these two tracks of if one, is if, if one's death is reasonably foreseeable, then no additional track. There's no not even a 10-day waiting period. That 10-day waiting period has been waived, although there wasn't, I don't think, great concern even with that 10-day waiting period. But there is this dual track now where one's death is, is not reasonably foreseeable, where one waits 90 days. And this is what we are telling people in those circumstances. And I have spoken to family members who are affected by this, and, and they are absolutely challenged by these circumstances where one is already, already intolerably suffering. They are suffering from a condition that is not going to go away. And they themselves are making this decision, having capacity in their own if we respect personal autonomy at all, surely a fundamental life decision like this is one that we have to respect. And we are telling these individuals that they have to wait another 90 days and suffer for another 90 days, not just suffer, but suffer intolerably for another 90 days. And I, I just, I think it is inexplicable that we are asking people to suffer intolerably, intolerably for that length of time. So those are the two specific issues I think that need to be addressed at committee in a serious way in order to make this bill not only constitutional, but to make this bill the best bill that it can be. And, and the last item, and, and I wish we dealt with it because, you know, this idea of constantly revisiting this conversation instead of just getting it right for Canadians in need, it, it's, it's frustrating, Mr. Speaker. And the, the latter element, you know, I mentioned Audrey Parker and we're we're addressing one type of advance request, but I do wish in the course of this legislation, we'd answered the second type of, of advance request where an individual has been diagnosed, but is not yet suffering intolerably, but that, that future is not so far away. And those individuals also should be in a place where they can make an advance request if we're to respect their autonomy and respect their wishes. And, and I do wish, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll finish with this, I know I'm running out of time, I just wish I just wish politics did not get in the way, and that's what this is. This bill is a cautionary step. It doesn't go as far as it could because of politics. Because I know conservative members will say it's too far, and others will say, "Well, we have to be concerned about vulnerable Canadians." Well, we know we can protect vulnerable Canadians and respect people's individual choices at the same time. And I wish politics didn't get in the way of, allevi of alleviating suffering. I wish politics didn't get in the way of respecting and protecting individual rights. And as the party that we like to say we're the party of the charter, well, I wish we carried through that promise and we demanded greater respect for individual rights in the course of C7. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable Member for Oshawa. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank my colleague for uh, a thoughtful speech. Um, myself, I've been getting phone calls basically on both sides of the issue. I'm having some people, as the colleague said, not going far enough. Other people are saying that it's going way too far. Um, I'd like to talk about one of my constituents, Carol, who had a very respectful conversation with me, um, totally respects the rights of uh, physicians who don't want to participate or people who don't want um, assistance uh, to uh, death. However, <clears throat> she has some concerns about advanced directives, and I think my colleague did touch on this. And I was wondering, his comment at the end was very important. He says it's important that we get it right. Um, as far as these advanced directives, does he actually think that this piece of legislation in front of us today actually addresses that? And does he feel that it's still supportable? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. For <clears throat> Beaches East York. It, it is supportable, particularly at second reading. And the, the Council of Academies basically identify three kinds of advanced requests. One, in the case of Audrey Parker, which I mentioned, where someone not only is already diagnosed, but they're already suffering intolerably. That bill, this bill does address that issue, and, and I'm glad that it does. The second issue, which I think is easy to address, and it's been recommended up and down by every expert who's looked at this, is where, where one is already diagnosed, but yet, not yet subject to intolerable suffering, we ought to provide an, an advanced request for that as well. We could address it with sunset clauses if, if folks are concerned. And the third is where someone is not yet diagnosed. And I would argue that we could probably get there, but I think at a minimum, we should have addressed the, the, the second advanced request where someone has already been diagnosed, but not yet intolerably suffering. That would have been a, a relatively straightforward one to address. And given the time period that we've had, especially in the course of COVID, uh, I, I wish we—I I, I wish this had been better addressed in, in this bill as well. Is there a commentaire? A virtual questions and comments. The member for Abitibi Témiscamingue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, first, I would like to uh, salute the ability to concentrate and his ability to balance his work and family life. And I also like to thank him for uh, his interventions, not only on the industry committee, but also on this issue. I'd like to give him the opportunity to uh, speak more to this issue at the end of his speech. He said, he talked about the ability to renounce an advance request and how would he think that this would be made more easily for persons? So the, the advantage of any view that respects personal autonomy is that one, one is not tied to a decision one has made. One can always revisit that decision. And the importance of advance requests are because we might lose capacity. And so if one is intoler intolerably suffering, in the case of Audrey Parker, but is so worried that she's not going to be able to make a, a decision to end her life and to access death with dignity because she might lose capacity, then we, of course, need an advance request. And, and that's exactly what this, what this bill provides. But that second category, where an individual who is diagnosed and has not yet begun to suffer intolerably, where their wishes are clear, where you know, where they have made it very clear that this is what they want as a matter of personal autonomy, we have to respect that as well. And of course, if we're to respect personal autonomy, one can always withdraw where one has capacity to do so. I get one more uh, quick question in and response. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Speaker. And I would like to thank my colleague for his comments. They were very thoughtful and they, they certainly resonated with me. My, my father-in-law is, is currently um, in a situation where he cannot give consent any longer. And so he is, he is trapped in a situation where we know he wouldn't want to be. Uh, so a lot of the comments that the member, member brought forward really do resonate with me. Um, at the beginning of his comments, he talked a lot about intolerable suffering and the, the need to um, to be able to alleviate that, that intolerable suffering. I'm just wondering if he could talk a little bit about where we came up with those 90 days. Where, where did the Liberal government come up with 90 days as the amount we should make people wait in intolerable suffering before they can get relief? Member for Beaches East York. 
Well, I can honestly say I have no idea, and I don't think that the 90 days is justified in the end. I do think this is an area, as I say, where the committee should examine this timeline and the committee should correct this timeline. So I hope when this comes back to us at third reading that we have avoided the blanket exclusion for mental illness. And if need be, we had a sunset clause to that provision to give the government more time if necessary, but we avoid the blanket exclusion in indefinitely. And two, that we that we cure that 90 day period and we and we reduce it significantly because we, we, we can't possibly want Canadians who are still of a sound mind to suffer intolerably for such an extended period of time.